Hello, this is Emacs Cast episode 5. I'm quite happy about the fact that uh, it's been 5 episodes already. Thank you again for your comments and your support. As usual, I will start with the config news. And the biggest update since the last episode is I think I completely switched from Helm to Ivy. It's a popular path for many Emacs users, as it appears. People seem to love Ivy as an alternative to Helm, even though Helm is extremely powerful. One of the reasons people like Ivy, I've seen many stories, people switching from Helm to Ivy is because it's less powerful. It looks and behaves as a minimalist alternative to Helm. If you look at those stories about people switching from Helm to Ivy, it's usually the same motivation. I didn't use many or most of the features of Helm, so I decided I, I can switch away. It's the same for me. I, I described how I use Helm in episode 2. It's just to switch buffers and uh, select candidates from projectile and search, and it works well. But every once in a while, I'll say hit tab and I see the list of uh, actions I can do on a candidate, and I never do anything anything like that. Maybe some time in the future I will feel the need to use those features so I might just switch back and the beautiful thing about Emacs is that I can switch back. I can actually use both at the same time and it works pretty well. For a week or two I kept both of them installed and while most of the key bindings for say search or global search I switched to Ivy. Some things I left in Helm, like switching buffers, because it shows you some meta information about buffers. The feature is called Helm Mini, and you can switch not only between open buffers, but uh, between recent files and bookmarks. But then it turns out Ivy has this feature. Uh, You can just add so-called virtual buffers to the buffer switcher, and it will show recent files and bookmarks as well. And with the additional package called Ivy Rich, you can add additional information to that switcher and it will look similar to that uh, Helm Mini thing. It will show you the name of the file, the name of the project, name of the mode for that buffer, etc. Another big reason is that, well, window management is still pain in the ass. It's one of the features I hate the most in Emacs. I like the idea and I I like this feature of having windows and and I use it all the time. I split windows, I, I... The only kind of splitting I did in Sublime was sometimes I split the window left and right side so that I can look at two pieces of code or, say, look at uh, a REPL and some code on the left, and that's it. In Emacs, I split windows different ways and move between them all the time, and this is great. But many, many things create windows, and uh, the way those windows are created or reused never makes sense to me. It's always something that doesn't make sense. There are lots of solutions and I've tried a couple and I've tried things like Shackle and I will talk about Windows management probably in some other episode because it's a big big issue and a big uh, feature and there are some solutions and I have to I have to explore more but Shackle didn't work for me for several reasons even though it does its its job well. The, the problem is actually deeper because not all windows are created in a way that Shackle can control. There are different types of window creation in Emacs and say Majid creates some windows in that way that Shackle can control, but some other windows that look kind of the same, they don't look exotic or different, they are created differently. Helm does that too. It, it creates some windows uh, using a different function. And Helm and Shackle cannot control all of Helm's windows. You can actually change this, kind of tweak it, because you can, of course, like in anything in Emacs, you can replace one function with another. So you can tell Helm to use a standard function to create windows. In that way, apparently nothing changes, but Shackle can control those windows. But I don't know, it doesn't work for everything and I couldn't find a way to control all of the Majid's windows. So I said the problem is many people don't like the fact that Helm uses full-blown buffers and, and creates new windows sometimes or reuses windows to show its buffers. So without any configuration, if you just install Helm and start using it, then you will see sometimes it's kind of weird. So 
say you have two windows open, one on the left and one on the right, and then you do, for example, search with Helm Swoop. It's kind of a replacement of incremental search, and you see a list of candidates and you can move between them, and it's just a local search within the buffer. If you launch Helm Swoop, the input will be in the bottom where you expect most of Emacs inputs are. It's kind of in a mini buffer, but the list of candidates will open in that other window. So if you were working on the left window and you launched Helm Swoop, the list of candidates will be in the right window. So for me, this doesn't make too much sense because, well, I had those two windows for a reason. Maybe I wanted to look at that second window, but Helm just reused that window and opened this buffer. Depending on the command, the buffer will still be there. Now, after you finish Helm Swoop, everything is restored, so you're okay. But that buffer that Helm created, it's somewhere, and it's in the list of buffers, and I can get back to it sometimes accidentally by changing current buffer. I don't know, it's kind of not what I want. When I did some search, I don't want this to be a thing ever. I want it to disappear forever. Now, both of those problems are solvable. You can manage the way Helm creates new windows. You can just say... uh, With something like Shackle, by the way, you can say that Helm should create a new window in the bottom of a certain size and never reuse windows, for example. And it works. And you can probably do something about killing buffers once you're done. As I said, I had some other problems with Shackle, so I didn't want to use it. And uh, Ivy, on the other hand, only uses the mini buffer. So it never creates new buffers. It never reuses windows. It never messes with your window configuration, at least it never does for me in my limited feature use. And for many people, and me included, this is the big feature of Ivy. It's minimalist and it only works in the mini buffer. I can do everything I did with Helm with Ivy now and I I could replace the whole workflow, including working with Projectile, doing global search, doing local search, looking at documentation, it just everything works. You can check it out on GitHub in my config. A few people told me that my config is nice and they used it as a starting point, which is great. That's what I wanted. But even though you can just clone it and run in your Emacs, most of the config is kind of just just a config, but some parts of it are personal. Like, I don't think you will like the way I do things. It's just for me. And some people ask me if they should use this config if they are starting Emacs, just like I did. And I don't think that's an excellent idea. That's that's okay, you can start it and uh, it's fine. But I, th- I thought that I will feel safer if I had this alternative kind of universal config for beginners that follows my conventions and ideas, but it's not personal for me. So I decided to create a separate setup and call it Castle Max. And the idea is that that's a complete Emacs setup for beginners for Mac OS. Nothing binds it to Mac OS physically. It's just a set of conventions. But the fact that Emacs by default doesn't behave like a first class Mac OS citizen bothered me. Now, if you download Emacs from the kind of official source, Emacs for macOSX.com. Many features kind of work like in any other macOS app, like you can save with command S and you can quit with command Q, you can even print with command P. You can, of course, go and download Aquamax, which is a separate specific build, a specific distribution for macOS, but it's kind of old. It's still based on Emacs 24, while the current version is 26.1, I think, and it's highly opinionated. Now, it tries to be, it kind of tries to be sublime or something like that, because it has tabs, like visual tabs, which is not what you expect of Emacs, but it's kind of super customized. It's still Emacs, and you can still do things Emacs way, but you will probably face some problems, and I don't think it's a good choice today for uh, beginners, especially if you plan to kind of invest into the Emacs ecosystem. So I wanted to make something similar, but keep it vanilla Emacs. Don't build anything on top of it. The basic idea of this Castle Max distribution or setup is that it supports and respects both macOS conventions and Emacs conventions. It doesn't sacrifice on any of those sites. By default, Emacs has this super key. And by default, 
if you install almost any kind of build on Mac, Mac's command key, the heavily used modifier key on Mac OS, maps to Emacs super key. And the super key in Emacs is underused. Most of the keyboard is now free, and I was able to map most of the keys to something that makes sense in Mac OS and kind of makes sense if you are coming from Sublime or VS Code or Atom. And I'm talking about things like Command P in all of those popular editors allow you to fuzzy search for files in the current project. And for many people, and me included, this is just muscle memory. And Castle Max does the same. It achieves that with Projectile and Ivy. One kind of a controversial thing is uh, Command Shift P opens MX, opens that common window in Emacs. This is kind of what happens in VS Code and Sublime and Atom. If you hit Command Shift P there, it opens this mode where you can launch certain commands. Now it's not like in Emacs you can launch any command. It's only those commands that that were kind of defined in this way. But again, for many people and me included, this is muscle memory. This is how I do. This is how I did, for example, uh, Git work from within Sublime. And of course, most of the things that you expect from a Mac OS app work there, like Command S to save, Command Shift S to save as, Command A to select all clipboard with Z, X, and C, Command O to open a file, and some other things like with Command G, you open the Majit status window. One thing that I did, which is kind of unusual for these setups, is I like how in Vim or, say, Evil Mode, you can navigate between words and, and characters and anything, really, without leaving the home row. You don't have to go to the arrows. Now, in Emacs, by default, you can use Control and PN to go up and down and F and B to go left and right. Now, many people like that. I don't. I don't think that that, make, that makes any sense. Uh, of course, you can get used to it and it will be just fine. It's not like it, it's a huge deal. But for me, I want arrows to be kind of in the arrow shape. Now, the fact that N and B are near one another, but one goes down and another goes back, it kind of the other way around. The down is forward for me in my head. Anyway, I want arrows to be on the home row and I want them in the arrow shape. So even Vim's default H, J, K, and L, I don't like that either because, well, they are not, they're, they're in a single row. Something that makes more sense for me is having I as up, J as left, L as right, and K as down. It's kind of a natural arrow shape and it's right there on the home row almost, except for I, but my fingers naturally go there. Now you can do that by customizing evil mode or you can customize something like goat mode, but I don't like model editing. So for this Castle Max setup and for my personal setup, I'm experimenting with this idea of using I, J, K, and L with command. So it's kind of easy on a standard Magic Keyboard, which is Mac Mac keyboard, but at, uh, it actually works with any keyboard that it doesn't matter. As I said, Castle Max is kind of built for Mac OS, but as long as you have some key on your keyboard that can be a super key, like a Windows key, it's fine. So on my keyboard, I can easily press command with my left hand's thumb, which is the strongest finger, and holding command, I can use IJKL as arrows. And it works It works great, I think. It, it takes some time to get used to. You don't need modes for that. And of course, it, it's only moving by characters. Now I'm thinking of how to incorporate movement by sentences or expressions, something that you do with Alt in Emacs, but it's still work in progress. Some other nice features is that you have the FN key on Mac and you could map it to Hyper, which is another Emacs modifier, but I didn't do that. I kept it as FN. FN with arrows, up and down arrows, are page up and page down. Even though you have the default page up, page down in Emacs with Control and Meta V, FN with up and down. For many Mac OS users, that is a natural page up, page down. If you hit FN with Alt, then you can scroll the other window, which is great because by default in Emacs, you can do that by hitting Command Meta V and Command Meta Shift V. Now it's quite hard to hold three modifier keys and then a key. This idea of 
adding alt or adding shift to a combination is going through castle max everywhere if some key combination works with say command or control then adding alt kind of does it for something alternative like other window and shift does it for some some higher level thing here's an example i have command comma to go back to some previous mark in the current buffer and command dot to go forward so this basically allows me to go back and forth between points of interest in my buffer this is super convenient and there is a built-in thing that you can use to go back uh, it's control u and then space but i don't think there's a built-in way to go forward with these custom key bindings it's super easy for me for example I'm, I'm at a certain line and i'm writing some code and i want to search for something look at that and then just come back to the place where i am i can set a bookmark here but this is an additional step and some mental work i just want to be here after i do something so i just do search i don't think about anything i go somewhere else I look at it, I even do something there, and then I hit command comma, and I chose comma because it's the same key as less than, and it kind of looks like a left, left arrow. So I hit command comma maybe a couple of times because I maybe did some more stuff, and eventually I come back to that place. Now with command dot, I can go forward in this tree of places. So command and these keys kind of move me through the current buffer, but if I hold shift, then it becomes a more high level thing and what is more high level than moving between points in a buffer it's moving between buffers and again there is a built-in command for that you can hit Control x and then left arrow or forward arrow to go back and forward but for me it makes sense to bind them to kind of the same thing and have shift as this high level modifier there are other nice things and i focused on key bindings mostly and I documented all those key bindings on the GitHub page. Check them out. Maybe you try this setup or some ideas from that setup. And the idea, the main thing is that it should be usable and approachable to complete beginners. So you don't have to actually know a lot of Emacs to start working productively somewhat. There is window management. There is a Git integration. There is built-in terminal. There's somewhat easier movement between windows that kind of makes sense for iTerm users. Oh, and there's a spell checking and synonym search and word definition, which of course are bound to a single key with different modifier keys that kind of make sense in, in the way that I explained. Yeah, that was a long section on config news. <laughs> so today I want to talk about org mode for blogging. Now, this is a big topic, of course, because uh, there are different ways you can create and maintain a blog using org mode. Now, just to remind you, there was a separate episode on org mode, which was episode three. This episode assumes you know a bit about org mode, you know what it is and how it works. If you know that, you know that you can export any page to HTML. So the simplest way, if you want to kind of set up a, a blog or just a site, you can just export all your pages using built-in exporter and host them somewhere. Those are static HTML pages. And by default, it's just unstyled HTML. It's the browser default kind of serif font on a white background. But it's quite easy to create templates and it's quite easy to find templates for that exporter. So you can actually make your pages quite nice and you don't need any additional software. It's fine for just static pages. You can set up some sort of sync or maybe serve it through GitHub pages by pushing it. It's fine for just a bunch of pages, but if you want to maintain a blog, you will probably want RSS. Now, at least I will want RSS if I'm reading a blog. I've seen several blogs written in org and they didn't have any RSS and that's frustrating because we still use that. I know many think it's dead, but uh, I think RSS is quite alive. I was thinking about this and I thought, yeah, you can, you can probably find the package for that. You can find a package that generates RSS and yeah, you can. It's not the best way. And I think I've, I have found the best way, but to explain that, I want to tell you my story, how I came to this setup and why, because it's still not for everybody. So I started kind of 
kind of blogging, writing something on the internet back in high school. And at that time, most of the blogs I knew of were on LiveJournal. It's, it was quite popular back then. Of course, you didn't have to do anything, really. You just sign up and you have a blog. It had some customization and it had a huge community. Of course, at some point, I thought I want some freedom. I want some customization. I want my website to look differently and I want my website to be somewhere else. I want my custom domain name or something like that. And then I discovered WordPress. And that was a huge romance for, I don't know, 10 years or something like this. For a long time, I loved WordPress and I used it extensively for everything. I was creating websites like crazy. I was amazed at how easy it was. So many themes that looked awesome, so many plugins. Oh my God, so many plugins. There's a plugin for anything. If I, if I thought of something, there is a plugin for that. And it, it mostly works. And it takes some time to set up. You need to kind of know your way around the server. You have to set up uh, a database and PHP and uh, upload files. But it was a great learning experience for me as a kid. And most of the websites I did, even I did some client work, like uh, making a website for small businesses in town. I always used WordPress and uh, it always worked for me. This freedom came with this price of having a full-blown application with a full-blown SQL database running to serve mostly just static content. Some of my sites were highly interactive. They had polls and comments and... But most of other websites I did, and my personal blog was just text and images. At some point, I even disabled comments because, well, I just didn't like comments. So now I'm having this huge multi-megabyte application and uh, a database, which is MySQL, I believe, running just to serve text. Now, I know that I can just create an HTML page and serve it. It will be cheaper on the server side, I can actually find free hosting if I just want to serve web pages. It will be faster because, well, it's just text. There are no SQL requests. I don't have to think about caching or anything like that. It, it just caching is there by default, uh, both in the web server and the browser. And it's more secure. It, there is no way to just hack an HTML page if the web server is set up correctly. But there are many ways to do something bad about both PHP and SQL database exposed to the internet. Now, I know SQL database should not be exposed to the internet, but uh, I was a kid, all right? So I was looking for a minimalist alternative to WordPress, and I didn't think about static web pages at that point. I was thinking about, yeah, I still need kind of the same. I, I still need this database and web app thing, but I want it to be small, nice, and have less moving parts. And I found a, a beautiful blogging engine called Egea, which is quite popular in a small group of Russian-speaking designers. It's built by a Russian designer called Ilyad Birman, and it was a beautiful experience after WordPress. You can still use it. I think it's still being released and updated, and there is an English version. Now, it's, it's a PHP app, and it's not even open source. It's like obfuscated PHP. It still uses MySQL, and it still stores everything in a database. But it's super minimalist. It's kind of beautiful because it's made by a nice designer and it just works. So I, I've been using that for maybe three or four years. And I didn't think too much about future-proofing my data. I was thinking about how my blog looks, how easy it is to write. And it was easy to write. You just open a browser and compare it to the WordPress editor, the Egea editor is just nothing. It's just a web page with one huge form. And you can drop images in, it will upload them automatically, insert. It has a lot of niceties. WordPress looks kind of like a nuclear submarine. It It's just huge. It's, yeah, I think it's kind of like Emacs, but, <laughs> but written in PHP. So I didn't think about future-proofing my data and I think I made a mistake in a way that that blogging engine uses custom formatting. It's kind of like Markdown. That was the price. At some point, I thought I want to just try something else. But now all of my data is written in this format that 
only makes sense within this system. This is when I learned about both Markdown and static website generators like Jekyll. I decided I should move to Jekyll and I should move all my data into Markdown files because first of all, it's not in a database. It's just a file that I can use, I can backup, I can touch. It's, it's just easy to manage the reason about. And I should convert them to Markdown because, well, at least that's some sort of universal format. It's actually far from universal. Uh, there are attempts to make kind of an official Markdown format, but there are still kind of flavors. And simple things like making things bold and or having links, it works in every flavor of Markdown in the same way. But some other things like tables and code highlighting and image, even like new lines, are treated differently in different flavors. And if you are writing Markdown in GitHub readmes, it could be different than writing Markdown for Jekyll. So I took my time, I exported everything uh, from that database and converted everything to Markdown and created my Jekyll-powered blog. Now, for those who don't know, Jekyll and other static website generators work this way. You have a template and Depending on the language, it could be something like Mustache or Jinja or Hamel, some sort of a templating language. It's basically an HTML file with dynamic blocks that will be replaced when the site is being generated. So you might have a template for a blog post. So you have a template and then you have data in markdown files and then you just run this app and it spits out the whole website just a static website with HTML images, styles, and some JavaScript. And then you can just upload the whole folder somewhere. To make it easier, GitHub actually supports Jekyll. So if you so you have a repository for Jekyll, you can just store your, your whole Jekyll thing there. You don't have to generate that folder full of static HTMLs and upload them. You just store your project with the source markdown files, with the templates and everything and GitHub will generate that folder for you. You don't even see that folder. You will just see the website working, which is great and free. And I used that for years and I still use it for my Russian blog. Now, this is where Emacs comes in. This year I started exploring Emacs. And of course, one of the promises of Emacs was that I could probably try to consolidate many different areas of my digital workflow into this one single app. I've tried doing the same with Sublime. I love Sublime text and I wanted to do more from within Sublime. And with some Markdown plugins, you can edit Markdown nicer. So I was trying to do that within Sublime and just write articles and from within Sublime and it kind of worked, but it took a lot of moving parts to do that because the way those markdown files in Jekyll work is that you have to have this front matter, this some meta information on top of the file in YAML format. And you can specify like custom URL and title and date and any sort of custom additional information you want to use in your templates. There are plugins for Sublime Text that generate them for you. Uh, or I just had this expanding snippet. I just wanted to right and like push one button and that's it. So once I tried Emacs, I thought, hey, there must be a decent Jekyll and Markdown plugins for Emacs. But it turns out there are nicer ways to maintain a blog in Emacs if you're willing to switch away from Jekyll. This big alternative to Jekyll is called Hugo. It's just another static website generator and it works in the same way that you have templates it's just a different language and it still has Markdown. And again, it's just a different flavor of Markdown. And it's still an app that generates HTML for you. GitHub Pages doesn't support Hugo. So you cannot just upload your Hugo project and expect it to build into a website. But GitHub Pages supports static pages. You can just upload your generated HTML pages into a different branch and it will serve those pages there is this fantastic Emacs extension called OX Hugo. And the idea is you write all your pages, all your blog posts in a single org file. And you just follow certain conventions like having headings, 
with certain tags if you want to have tags in your blog and having some meta information so that Hugo knows how to name your files. And that's it. You don't have to touch Markdown. You just write in org in a single file. Now, you can write in separate files as well, but the original idea was that you write it in a single file. This extension automatically creates Markdown for Hugo, and then Hugo generates the site. Now my workflow looks like this. I run Hugo server. Unlike Jekyll, it has... Now, maybe modern Jekyll already has this, but Hugo has this feature of not only watching for changes live and rebuilding site as your content changes, but actually navigating to the changed file. So I run the Hugo server, I open localhost in the browser, I then go to Emacs, open my single file where all my posts are, either just create a new post, that means just creating a new heading, or I use or capture from anywhere within Emacs. For me, it's control C, C, and then I see a list of capture templates and I select H for Hugo, and then just write a title and some text, and that thing is added to that single file. The corresponding markdown file is generated automatically. Now, by default, it's not like that. By default, you have to export using the org exporter, but OX Hugo documentation website includes a description of how to make it export automatically. So I, of course, I want I want to do nothing. And since this export happens, the markdown file changes. Hugo sees that change, regenerates this page, and reloads the page in the browser. On the left side, I have Emacs with org mode open. On the right side, I have my browser, and I just write and save and see the changes instantly. It's actually really fast. It feels faster than Jekyll. Maybe that's because my site is uh, kind of small now, but it's less than a second. I save, I see the page reloading almost instantaneously. It's amazing. Instant preview of exactly what you're going to see when you go live. Now, since this is org mode and each blog is in inside a heading, those headings can have statuses. By default, it has no status, but if you go to that heading and hit shift right, you start changing the status. So it can become to do, and then it becomes draft. Well, that's how I set it up. And then it becomes done. When it's done, the current date and time is written into the meta information to the properties drawer of that heading. And this is how OX Hugo knows that this post is actually publishable. By default, Hugo will not publish your drafts. This is kind of great because now I have both the content of my blog and kind of planning section of my blog. I can create to-dos, like I want to write this article sometime. I, ha I just have an idea. So I or capture it and I change it to to-do. I can work on it. I can still see previews and kind of continue working on it for any time I want. And it just stays there. I can even set up a deadline and have that task appear in my org agenda. This is what I wanted when I was talking about consolidation. Now, I use an external GTD to-do app called Things. Before, if I wanted to remind myself about writing some article for my blog, I would create that task in Things. And it's just a task. It has nothing to do with the actual content. It's a completely separate, isolated system. Now, having Emacs and org mode in this OX Hugo, the content and the task and the GTD process of having and writing that content are merged into one system. It's, it just makes sense. It's, it's quite fantastic. And even so, I am using like 1% of the features of org mode and maybe 10% of the features of OX Hugo. So there is still room to grow, but even within this tiny, tiny portion of what I learned, it's already a, a fantastic improvement in my workflow. So I started writing a bit more lately on, on my blog. Uh, you can visit it on rakim.org. And I thought, okay, what features of org mode will be available if they are converted to Markdown? So I know org by default can include can include math equations and symbols and use LaTeX to render them. I thought, okay, let's try this. What if I just write some math within that org mode file and it didn't work? And then I remembered, well, of course, it's going into 
HTML by the end. And HTML cannot display these things by default. But there is a library for that, uh, and it's called MathJax. It basically takes into LaTeX, it basically takes LaTeX and generates SVGs using JavaScript. So I just Googled OX Hugo MathJax, and of course there is a section in the documentation of OX Hugo of how to use MathJax. You just add this one JavaScript and that's it. It just works. So I, I've written a couple of articles uh, on math, mostly because I, I liked uh, to play. I wanted to play with this feature. It's fantastic. It just works. Now, I was talking about the documentation page for OX Hugo, which is fantastic. The guy who wrote this, Kaushal Modi, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, when I published episode 4, I was talking about OX Hugo and how I used it to convert both my blogs to OX Hugo, the Emacs Cast website and my personal blog. And the first comment I got on Reddit after publishing that episode was from Kaushal. And he said, thank you for shootout. And he asked if I had any problems, if I had any issues. And I said, yeah, the only issue I had is that I didn't know how to add custom front matter because the official docs don't have that info. I found it in the samples and in GitHub issues. And I said, well, I'm about to leave for a road trip. And when I come back, I'll do my best to create a PR to add that info to the docs. Just a few hours later, I see another comment from him saying, you mean this? And linking to a new, just newly created section in the documentation that explains how to create custom front matter. Uh, the guy is fast and he he's passionate about this uh, project and he's passionate about having fantastic documentation for a project, which is an awesome feature for any open source project to have. And by feature, I mean having this kind of maintainer. So thank you, Kaushal, again. Thank you for OX Hugo and, and for writing this wonderful documentation. He's not alone, of course. There are uh, contributors to this project. Even if, if you think it's too much work switching your blog to something like Hugo completely, check out OX Hugo. The amount of niceties and the amount of automation and the amount of just this first-class integration in org and Emacs might make sense and might pay off if you use Emacs daily. All right, that's it. Thank you. I know I have said that I will cover certain topics. I was talking to you guys, uh, to the listeners of this podcast, mostly on Reddit and Twitter, and I'm still taking in suggestions. Now, there are, there are plenty of suggestions for maybe five, ten next episodes but if you have an idea or a question or any topic you want to hear about, let me know in the Reddit or Twitter or email me at emaxcast at rakim.org. Yep. Yeah. See ya.